You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Monday, 24th of June, 2013. GCHQ is worse than U.S. on collecting data from internet and phone calls. Bristol's religious community has come together to reflect on murder of Lee Rigby. Ex-soldiers in crime cases need own court. French minister, the EU, is fueling the far right. 15 million signatures to oust Egypt's Mohamed Morsi. Friends of Syria to provide material and equipment to opposition. Syrian rebels murdered my 14-year-old for a joke. Thought for the day, vive la différence, or is it? And finally, Irma moving tip. UK News. GCHQ is worse than US on collecting data from internet and phone calls. British eavesdropping agency GCHQ has secretly accessed fibre optic cables carrying huge amounts of internet and communications data, according to documents disclosed by whistleblower Edward Snowden. The agency is able to tap into and store data, including phone calls and emails between innocent people, from the cables for up to 30 days, so it can be analysed under Operation Codename Tempora, The Guardian reported. The Cheltenham-based agency would not comment on intelligence matters, but insisted it was scrupulous in complying with the law. Bristol's religious communities come together to reflect on the murder of Lee Rigby. A declaration that Bristol's religious communities will stand together against terrorism and racial violence was made at a multi-faith gathering to reflect on the death of soldier Lee Rigby. The event, held at the Shah Jalal Mosque in Eastern last night, was attended by Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, Jews, Buddhists and Quakers, as well as people of no faith. World at Eight says... For Muslims to be at the event is a desecration of this poor man's soul, let alone holding it in a mosque, the religious edifice of the Islamic bastards who killed him. Only in England. Ex-soldiers in crime cases need their own court. Proposals to set up special courts to handle minor crimes committed by British former servicemen and women will be debated next week. Labour will table an amendment to the Offender Rehabilitation Bill to establish a pilot project on US-style courts to help veterans beat the pattern of reoffending. Labour's health spokesman in the Lords, Lord Beecham, said it was time to extend the Armed Forces Covenant to include extra help for offenders who served their country. In the UK, there are an estimated 20,000 former servicemen and women currently in prison or on probation. Veterans aged between 16 and 44 are also three times more likely to have mental health problems than the general population. Struggling to adjust to civilian life, many try to deal with post-traumatic stress or depression through drink or drugs, which can lead thousands into crime. In the US since its launch in 2008, the Veterans Treatment Courts have spread to every US state. Judge Robert T. Russell presides over the court in Buffalo, New York, where reoffending rates are less than 10% compared to a national average of 65%. He appoints volunteer mentors to work with offenders on finding homes, jobs and rebuilding broken relationships. The volunteers range from social workers to police detectives who have served in the military. European News. French minister, the EU, is fueling the far right. An outspoken French minister rounded on the EU over the weekend, accusing it of adding fuel to France's far-right national front by ignoring the wishes of the people of Europe and pressuring European governments. The Minister for Industrial Renewal, Arno Montebourg, laid into European Commission President José Manuel Barroso over his recent description of France's stance on the proposed EU-US free trade zone as reactionary. Mr Barroso is the fuel of the Front National, Montebourg told France Interradio on Sunday. He is the fuel of Italian protest party leader Beppe Grillo. Barroso has been in the firing line of French politicians of all shades since making dismissive remarks about France's insistence on excluding the film and television sectors from international trade liberalisation under a policy known as the cultural exception. But Montebourg made the issue much broader by suggesting Barroso's comments were symptomatic of a deeper problem with the way power is wielded by the European Union's executive arm in Brussels. 
I think the main cause of the rise of the Front National is related to the way in which the EU today exerts considerable pressure on democratically elected governments, Monteberg said. You have the President of the European Commission who says all those who are anti-globalisation, they are reactionaries. These are the same people who have today turned the European Union into an institution that is anti the people of Europe. In the end, the EU does not act. It is immobile, paralysed. It does not respond to any popular aspiration on the industrial front, on the economic front or on the budgetary front. And in the end, that furthers the cause of all pro-sovereignty anti-European parties in the EU. World News 15 million signatures to oust Egypt's Prep Mohamed Morsi. The liberal secular rebel group has reached the threshold of 15 million signatures to impeach the government of Mohamed Morsi. This was announced yesterday by Mahmoud Badir, co-founder of the initiative at the conference for the launch of the Rebels Week, a week of demonstrations against the government of the Muslim Brotherhood that will end on June the 30th. Meanwhile, Morsi supporters have launched a counter-campaign stating that they will have already collected 10 million signatures in support of the President. Yesterday afternoon, thousands of people gathered at the end of Friday prayers, expressing solidarity with the head of state. They call for the rebels to respect the people's will and announce other peaceful sit-in protests in various Egyptian cities. This is why the police and army have sounded the alarm about possible clashes between protesters from opposing factions. Launched in mid-May, the rebel campaign has gathered more and more support amongst Egyptians. For over a month, young people have travelled all over the country door to door, collecting the necessary signatures for the petition of no confidence, which, if upheld by the Supreme Court, could lead to an early presidential election. Young people have also asked the UN to act as an impartial guarantor to verify the authenticity of the material presented. To sign up, each person had to write their ID number next to their signature and mark their fingerprint. At the time, the initiative has collected more signatures than the 13.2 million votes obtained by President Morsi in the 2012 elections. Friends of Syria to provide material and equipment to opposition forces. Western and Arab nations opposed to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad have agreed to give urgent support to Syrian rebels. They also called for Hezbollah fighters from Iran and Iraq to withdraw from Syria. Ministers from the 11 main countries, which form the Friends of Syria group, agreed to provide urgently all the necessary material and equipment to the opposition on the ground. They also condemned the intervention of Hezbollah militias, militias and fighters from Iran and Iraq, calling on them to withdraw immediately. Qatar hosted the talks and on Saturday Qatari Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim tried to dispel concerns which have been voiced in the US and in Europe about we weapons given to the rebels ending up in the hands of extremists. If we send weapons they will be delivered to the right quarters, Jassim said. World Today says, platitudes, all platitudes. All the so-called rebels are extremists and yell Allahu Akbar every time they shoot. So what is this about right hands? All international gobbledygook. Syrian rebels murdered my 14-year-old for a joke. An Aleppo woman has described the moment she saw Syrian rebels murder her 14-year-old son for cracking a joke about the Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad Qatar was shot dead in broad daylight by Islamist fighters in the city, which has been at the heart of the insurrection against the regime of President Bashir Assad. Nadia Um Faud, Mohammed's mother was just yards away when her son, a drummer boy in the revolution's early protest marches, was shot three times and left for dead. Her testimony comes as the US sought to persuade Western and Arab allies to commit to directing all aid to Syrian rebels through the Western-backed Supreme Military Council to try to reduce the power of jihadi groups. She told the Daily Telegraph how she was at home in Aleppo's Shah district when the rebel fighters, who she believes were foreigners, drove her badly beaten son back to his home neighbourhood. Hearing the warning shouts of neighbours, she ran to the apartment's balcony, where she saw a group arrive. Mohammed had been working at the family's coffee stall in Aleppo's Shah district when he made the quip that sealed his fate. Asked by a customer to hand over a coffee in return for later payment, he shouted, I wouldn't give the Prophet Mohammed credit if he came here today. Two men who overheard his comment marched over and dragged him off in a car ignoring his protestations of piety and even the objections of a militiaman from the Free Syrian Army. World Date says, What was that about not handing more arms to extremists? 
What is killing a youngster in cold blood but an extreme act? If Assad's forces had killed him, the entire UN would be holding a sodding vigil, and Allah only knows what the BBC would have to say. Thought for the day, viva la difference, or is it? Thought for the day, viva la difference, or is it? My thought today centres around Russia, the UK, and the difference in our ways of approaching problems. In fact, the main problem, which affects 90% of European countries, a very few of which border the Russian bear, and that is immigration. Now, when the curtain was up and before the well-planned and well-orchestrated downing of the Berlin Wall, which was the first in many moves to get rid of unemployable people into the more prolific, in those days, Western and non-communist countries, and which did, to a very large extent, exceed, I had very little time for the Russians and their way of life. Ghastly, all that sodding snow and real fur. And the mantra of the Communist Party. Their mantra, like all other supposedly positive messages to any people, looked perfect on paper and in the meeting halls, but always failed to apply to the human condition, which is far from perfect. Show me a true communist society, a true democratic society, a true fascist society, and a true humanitarian society, and I'll eat my hat. But you can't because they don't exist in the real world, where riches and power corrupt absolutely the already strange human thought processes. Now, the way we approach immigration, that bane of so-called civilised society in the UK, and the way the now free Russian government apply it, is very different, and could allow for the differences in social norms that apply to both our cultures. I'm reading out a letter sent by our member, an activist in Newcastle, underline, and this activist is partially cited and relies on our nationalist news. His disability in no way stops him from speaking his mind, and this letter was published by the Sentinel on the 7th of June. Dear Sir, Due to the lack of a referendum in Britain's place in Europe, a democratic right denied by Labour and an empty electioneering gesture by the Conservatives, a benefit system created by the British people for the British people is being brought into disrepute by an accusation from Brussels. That, to paraphrase, the current British government's refusal to support EU benefits tourism is tantamount to racism. Why can't our so-called friends in the European Parliament legislate that the UK must pass on EU scroungers to France, where they're richer pickings for benefit migrants, given the fact that not even the families of most of them have even paid into our system? If it is racism to believe that charity begins at home, then I'm a racist and proud of it. However, the true racism in Britain is but alas fuelled by the pandemic of political correctness that encourages Brit to hate Brit and favour foreign scroungers, who in some cases hate our guts and preach it on the streets. Yours sincerely. Now this letter is non biased and sensible, but we know that any letter along these lines sent by a known BNP activist will never hit the nationals, although technically there's nothing wrong and everything right with it. Phrasing and content are all perfectly suited to the UK today. Would this be printed in Russia or would it feature on Russia Today's news screens? Well, it might if President Putin had said it. And remember, Putin was the only member of the G8 to refer directly linking the murderers of drummer Lee Rigby and Woolwich to Islamic jihadists. Now, I personally have a lot of time for Putin, although some of my email friends do not. I've been receiving emails from the white supremacist guys, with whom I have no quarrel as everyone is entitled to their view, in my view, with stories of Putin being Jewish and favouring the Jews in Russia. Well, that makes a change from the Stalinist times when Jews were persecuted en masse. Whilst our UK papers are slanging him off for insider dealings and being part of the Russian mafiosi and murdering various dissidents in the process, but I fear the lady doth protest too much, and because of his stand about Syria and the West's possible or probable interference in that country, his name will be muddied for some considerable time. Why? Because, as a nationalist to my fellow nationalists, anyone who tries to look after his own tribe and land before other tribes from other lands is not to be lauded in any way in the Western media circus. Now I'm reading from a very interesting missive that's been sent to me. Russia says no to the immigration invasion by Mark Rousset, translated by Michael O'Meara. In matters of demography, Russians are less naive than the West Europeans, who indoctrinated as they are in the new human rights religion, deny the catastrophic reality of third world immigration. 
Though West Europeans ridicule Russia for the decline of her population, they do so for getting the third world beams that run across their own populations. There's no question Russians will continue to experience great difficulties, but due to measures taken by President Putin and Prime Minister Medvedev, they are facing these difficulties and will eventually overcome them, without compromising their future or their identity. Western European elites, on the other hand, have committed a crime, an absolutely unpardonable treason, against the flesh and blood homeland of all Europeans. By allowing in masses of non-European immigrants, the immigrants continuing to cross the border behind Sarkozy's mediocratic smoke and mirrors, 250,000 of them, a third of the population of Lyon, arriving each year. Most of whom, particularly those coming from Africa, are simply unassimilable. By the way, this report was done in 2009 under Sarkozy, so these rules have been in place in Russia for around four years and are working. Today, the sole realistic perspective on Western Europeans' future is one of inescapable civil war, like Lebanon, Bosnia, Kosovo, Georgia, African countries and Ceylon, if measures are not immediately taken to revive the natality of the native European population. By contrast, the future belongs to Russia, despite her present difficulties, particularly those of the catastrophic decade of 1990-2000 to 2000, under Boris Yeltsin when the population was in free fall, declining by 800,000 individuals per year. The falling Russian birth rate began, in fact, in the 80s, with the first signs of Soviet exhaustion and the coming implosion. In 2007, when Putin introduced his plan to stabilise the population, Russia counted less than 142 million inhabitants, while the population had been 150 million in 1992. A report from the Novosti Agency in 2007 paints a vivid image of the inevitable collapse Russia loses 100 inhabitants every hour, every 14 seconds there's a death and every 21 seconds a birth. Public opinion in Russia remains hostile to immigration. Contrary to certain tall stories in the West, even if the yellow peril is something quite real, especially for Siberia and Russia's Far East, the highest estimate of the Chinese immigrant population is 400,000, according to Zanya Zaanshuskaya, head of an institute affiliated with the Russian Academy of Sciences, that studies immigration. It's not the millions and millions that have been announced. The Russians are alert to the danger and have taken severe measures to ensure that there will be no mass migration from China. They have halted the repatriation of Russians from outside Russia and several million immigrants from the Caucasus. Raising the birth rate and pursuing natalist policies are Russian policies. Russia reacted to her democratic crisis with a good deal of sense, thinking courageously and endeavouring to revive the birth rate. In 2003, following the proposal of the Conservative deputy Alexandra Shuev, the Russian parliament made abortion more difficult to receive. In May 2006, President Putin introduced his natalist policy, which grants mothers a maternity bonus of 17,350 euros for the birth of a second child and 18,825 euros for the third child. Since February 2006, birth certificates have been introduced to maternity wards where they're filled out immediately following a birth, enabling the mother to gain ready access to her maternity bonus. Her midwife, too, is given an assistant bonus of €294 Euros for every birth she assists. These figures are from 2006. Russia also faces a real social drama in the area of housing, given the absence of appropriate dwellings for children, which has often contributed to single-child families. Construction, now in full upswing, will play a role in improving the birth rate. Along with education, agriculture and health, housing now constitutes one of the four national projects of Russia's 2020 perspective. In the United States, the post-war baby boom was the consequence of a mass migration from the city centres towards the suburbs, toward the land. Life expectancy, according to Boris Bevich of the Centre for Russian Demography, was 59 during the 1990s, 20 years lower than that of Western Europe. In 2010, it's at 69. The demographic plague afflicting Russians at the beginning of the new millennium was that of the following magnitude. Alcoholism, 34,500 deaths a year. Nicotine addiction, 500,000 deaths a year. Cardiovascular disease, 1.3 million deaths a year. Cancer, 300,000 deaths. Traffic accidents, 39,000 deaths. Murders, 36,000. Suicides, 46,000. The degradations of the health system once the pride of the USSR and its catastrophe it's provoked with its high infant mortality. 11 stroke 1,000 births, twice the EU rate. 
Beyond the measures already in place, progress is still needed to diminish the abortion rate, which fell 25% from 2003 to 2008, though it remains high, with 1.2 million abortions per 1.7 million births in 2008. Russia, moreover, will have to compensate for the hysteria that the catastrophic years had on the structure of the Russian population, for it greatly diminished the strata necessary for reproduction. Do you note the similarities to the UK? The return to traditional values to the orthodox faith will also contribute to breaking the pattern of one-child families. All real progress, though, rests on a revolution, a revolution of attitude or mind that favours large families. The situation in Russia is nevertheless now far less desperate than Germany. In 2010, Medvedev supplemented Russia's Putin's measures by granting a large tax break for the third child, 72 euros a month and for each additional child. Has Russia avoided the mistake the West has made? Hmm. In conclusion, the rising Russia birth rate is the result of policies pursued by Vladimir Putin, Dmitry Medvedev and their governments. The falling birth rate in the West is the result of policies pursued by the ruling globalist elites, who take no account of what they've created. Dechristianization, moral corruption, the liberalization of birth control, abortion, homosexuality, feminism, female labor, the destruction of full small farms, the concentration of the population in large metropolises, the reduction of family housing, no longer reserved for native French families, but only immigrant families, the height of idiocy, part of the programme suicide, what's called the culture of death. The historian Emmanuel Leroy Ladouri, member of the French Academy, points out that the large number of annual French abortions, 200,000, equals the infant mortality rate of Louis XVI's age. Can one actually speak of progress with these conditions? The global oligarchy has a single remedy for declining birth rates. Immigration. Its objective is to fabricate at the planetary level a population of refugee and uprooted populations opposed to one another in a sort of global civil war as peoples become minorities in their own homelands. Though the difficulties facing her are far greater than those of the EU, Russia has said no to the Western folly. She is showing us the way we can redress our demographic problems and put a stop to immigration. The way, in a word, our European civilization will survive. Marc Rousset is an economist and the author of La Nouvelle Europe, Paris, Berlin, Moscow, in 2009. So love him or hate him, Putin is at least trying to do something for his country and, more importantly, his people. One of the latest slurs against him is that he made a speech at Moscow Jewish Museum which alluded to the fact that over 80% of the first Soviet government was Jewish, but this is nothing new. In fact, Churchill said the same thing about the anti-Zionist pro-Trotsky Jews in Russia. The founding fathers of the Communist Party were mainly Jewish. So Putin was simply repeating what history has taught us, and I quote, I thought about something just now. The decision to nationalise this library was made by the first Soviet government, whose composition was 80-85% to 85 Jewish, Putin said, June the 13th during a visit to Moscow's Jewish Museum and Tolerance Centre. According to the official transcription of Putin's speech at the museum, he went on to say that the politicians on the predominantly Jewish Soviet government were guided by false ideological considerations and supported the arrest and repression of Jews, Russian Orthodox Christians, Muslims and members of other faiths. They grouped everyone into the same category. Widely seen as the first Soviet government, the Council of People's Commissars was formed in 1917 and comprised 16 leaders, including Chairman Vladimir Lenin, Foreign Affairs Chief Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin, who was in charge of the People's Commissariat of Nationalities. It's well known that the true communist message is one of no religious affiliations whatsoever, which could replace the totalitarian state. On February 4th, 2013, Vladimir Putin addressed the Duma, the Russian parliament, and gave a speech about the tensions with minorities in Russia. I quote, In Russia live Russians. Any minority from anywhere, if it wants to live in Russia, to work and eat in Russia, should speak Russian, and should respect the Russian laws. If they prefer Sharia law, then we advise them to go to those places where that's the state law. Russia does not need minorities. Minorities need Russia. And we will not grant them special privileges or try to change our laws to fit their desires, no matter how loud they yell discrimination. 
We better learn from the suicides of America, England, Holland and France if we are to survive as a nation. The Russian customs and traditions are not compatible with the lack of culture or the primitive ways of most minorities. When this honourable legislative body thinks of creating new laws, it should have in mind the national interest first, observing that the minorities are not Russians. The politicians in the Duma gave Putin a five-minute standing ovation, as indeed if any English politician had had the gumption to make a speech like that in our Parliament, so would a great majority of the English people. In the UK, however, we have a diversity-ridden socialist state, which encourages foreign cultures, religions and blood. One of the latest wonders to come out is that the UK male employment rate higher for immigrants, says OECD. Employment declines smaller amongst foreign-born men than UK-born since financial crisis and reverse among women. The findings feature in the Paris-based think tank's 420-page International Migration Outlook Report for 2013, which also reveals the total permanent immigration in the 34 OECD countries was higher in 2011 than in 2010. Looking at whether the financial crisis reversed progress made by migrants over the past decade, the report said, despite a decline in their employment rates during the crisis, male migrants in the United Kingdom had higher levels of employment than native-born men from 2007 onward. So, who is the better man? Putin with his laws and rigid anti-immigration policies and positive laws for the Russian people, or Camoran and our lot with their handouts to immigrants, adjusting our culture and benefit system to accommodate immigrants, adopting EU laws giving all immigrants human rights in host countries to the detriment of indigenous peoples and early migrants, allowing the media and educational bodies to advertise the delights of enrichment and generally to all intents and purposes socially engineer drastic changes to both the British and their old way of life without being held accountable. Our abortion laws are a form of genetic engineering, as are our laws regarding alcohol and drugs for our own youth. Which would you rather have? A so-called tyrant or a politically correct moron? It's your choice in the end, my friends. As the old Hungarian proverb says, and my Hungarian is not good, so we'll do English translation afterwards. Yavani Nipnic Hosayo. Cowardly people don't have their own country. And finally, Ima Muvintep. Mystery as a museum statue starts turning in a display case. An Egyptian statuette that mysteriously turns itself around inside its case has been reported in the Telegraph. Even eminent television physicist Professor Brian Cox has weighed in on the mystery of Manchester Museum's moving statuette. The 10-inch tall statue of Neb Sanu, which dates back 18 to 1800 BC. The statuette which was discovered in the mummy's tomb has been with the museum for 80 years, but has only recently been noticed to be moving. Professor Cox, who teaches physics at the city's university, claims the movement is due to the differential friction. However, Manchester's museum resident Egyptologist Campbell Price suggested something more sinister, an Egyptian curse. I noticed one day that it had turned around. I thought it was strange because it's in a case and I'm the only one who has the key. He explained in an interview with the Manchester Evening News. I put it back, but then the next day it had moved again. We set up a time-lapse video, and although the naked eye can't see it, you can clearly see it rotate on the film. It, the statuette is something that used to go in the tomb along with the mummy. In ancient Egypt, they believed that if the mummy was destroyed, then the statuette can act as an alternative vessel for the spirit. Maybe that's what's causing the movement. He went on to cast doubt on Professor Cox's explanation. Brian thinks it's deferential friction, where the two surfaces, the serpentine stone of the statuette and the glass shelf it's on, cause a subtle vibration which is making the statuette turn. But it has been on those surfaces since we have had it, and it has never moved before. And why would it go round in a perfect circle? This presenter says, why indeed? I have seen the video, and it does turn. Also, the other three statues in the case do not turn, just Neb Sanu. Maybe the Earth's rotation is changing, maybe it's a curse coming into fruition after so long. As a superstitious person and a respecter of ancient burial grounds, anything goes. People are only too happy to put things down to natural causes, but whereas there is always an ex explanation for something not happening, what is the real reason for this happening? 
Is it a warning of some sort relating to the Middle East? Mummies should not be stolen or taken from their burial grounds, even for, more, for museums and for the public to gawk at. But then that's only my humble opinion. It took the Germans to start excavating ancient Egypt, not the Egyptians, who had allowed the desecration of many of the ancient Egyptian artefacts by Islam, and indeed had only just started at the start of the last century to cash in on the treasures that were ancient Egypt. Despite all the TV programmes by Dr. Awas, alias Hissing Sid of the Cairo Museum. Spooky! You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I wish you all a very good night.